Hi, I'm Marin. Welcome back to my channel, Marin Makes It. Today, I want to talk about one of those logistical issues that anybody traveling full-time or interested in traveling full-time will eventually encounter, and that is having no address. I've been living like this for a year and a half now, so I definitely have run into this with everything from my car registration expiring to wanting to do some online shopping. So I put together some tips that I wish I would have known before I started traveling. Not all of these will apply to everyone and every situation, but I think anybody wanting to travel full time will find something helpful in here. So you can no longer check the box that says your billing address matches your shipping address. Now what do you do? So the first thing to be aware of is something called USPS forwarding. So when you move, you can file online with USPS, which is the United States Postal Service, that says your past address, your current address, and then you pay about a dollar. And for the next six months, for anything that gets sent to your old address to you gets sent instead to that address. This is basically the same thing you would do if you were moving addresses as well. For your new address though, in this case, I would recommend putting the address of a family member or a friend, preferably one you also trust to open your mail for you because it can be really helpful to have them open bills for you or things that are maybe like you don't, you're not sure what they are, especially if it's gonna be a while before you come through that spot to check the mail because the last thing you want is to get late fees on bills or not be aware of something happening since there are sometimes official communications that can only come through the mail. For example, my insurance went up and apparently they are not required to email me when my insurance goes up, but they send me a paper statement in the mail. If I hadn't had my mom opening that mail for me, I would have never known why I was suddenly being billed more every month. Before we get to tip number two, I just want to remind you to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell button, hit the like button to like this video. By doing so, you're basically voting for this video and saying that YouTube should recommend this to other travelers. And now without further ado, tip number two. My tip number two is to switch as many things as you can over to online statements before you even start traveling. This way it avoids the entire problem of bills coming in the mail and you having no other way to see them. Setting up those portals for things, I know it can take a little bit of time and be very annoying to have so many different passwords for so many different things, but when you're trying to streamline your life and have less mail, taking advantage of all these online services and getting online statements is really helpful in staying on top of your finances and being aware of what's happening everywhere. Tip number three is to ship ahead of where you're traveling, plan ahead a little bit. So for the first half year that I was traveling, I was spending an average of about five nights in one place. Sometimes that meant spending one night in a campground here and there. Other times I spent a little over a week staying with a friend or a family member maybe. But what I would kind of try to do is anticipate where I would be next and then use my friends and family's addresses as a place where I knew I could receive mail and send things like packages or shopping or things I had to order to that address. When you're doing this, definitely assume that everything is going to take longer to ship than it says it will. You definitely don't want to end up missing your package or having to change your trip to receive a package because of this. I don't know what happened to under promise and over deliver as a slogan for doing business, but shipping carriers definitely don't follow this rule. And I find that most of the time my packages seem to be running late lately. So giving yourself maybe an extra week lead time there, just assuming everything's gonna take longer to ship than it says it will, will save you a headache here. I've never had a friend or family member have a problem with me doing this. I just want to give them a heads up, ask their permission out of courtesy to them, and then give them a heads up when a package is actually coming so that they just know to keep a lookout for it and don't get any unexpected surprises. I feel like you never want to use somebody's address without giving them a heads up first. The strategy is to use the pickup in store option when shopping for things online. Sometimes when ordering online, you have a choice of whether you want to have something delivered to your home address or to pick it up at the closest store near you. So whenever you have this choice, it makes sense in this situation to take advantage of that. Sometimes this will actually save you money because you don't have to pay a delivery or a shipping fee when you pick something up in a store and I found this works really well as long as you pay attention to where you are and make sure that you're shipping to the correct town and that your location has been properly updated in whatever app or ordering system you're using. My fifth suggestion is to take advantage of Amazon lockers. I honestly wasn't even aware that these existed for the first half year or so that I was traveling but since then it's been hugely convenient for me. 
So basically, if you were living under a rock like I was, on Amazon, when you check out, you have the choice to either ship to an address or you also have the choice to pick up your order in a locker instead. These lockers can be found across the country. They can be inside of apartment buildings or businesses, especially Whole Foods. They can also be outside of a business. For example, I've been to quite a few that are on the outside of a gas station or a 7-Eleven. Once your package has arrived there, you basically get an email. It tells you a QR code and, and you go to that locker location. You scan the QR code and then magic. One of the doors opens to reveal your package. A few things to note with Amazon delivery lockers is that they do actually return the stuff back to Amazon if you don't pick it up in a couple of days. So don't go ordering things too far in advance of when you can actually realistically pick it up in that location. The second thing to know is that not everything on Amazon can be shipped to an Amazon locker. Certain items that are fulfilled by sellers other than Amazon, but that you still buy through Amazon, those items will say that they cannot be shipped to a locker. The last thing to know about Amazon delivery lockers is that some lockers are 24 seven, for example, the ones outside of a building, but the ones inside of a business or a building will have the same hours as that business does, meaning that you have to pay attention to the hours of that business when you're going to plan to go pick up your package. My sixth suggestion is to use the address of the Airbnb or house sit that you're doing to get mail there. The nice thing about this is you don't have to leave your house like you do when you're picking something up from a delivery locker, which is very nice. All you have to do is open the front door. Of course, ask the homeowner or the Airbnb host first before you do this, but I've never really had anybody say no to me for doing this when I kind of explain the situation that I'm in and ask nicely. My next suggestion is for those of you that have a hub that you keep coming back through or are more localized to a certain area, and that is to get a UPS mailbox. I had one of these while I was house sitting in all across the Denver metro area. It ended up costing me about $30 a month, but I think it was well worth it to have one address that I could get everything sent to from statements or bills to online shopping. And I could even use it at doctor's offices because there's a few perks with a UPS address that you don't have with a USPS PO box that makes it a lot more useful to you. The first perk is that you can find a UPS store that's open Monday through Sunday. The post office is usually closed on Sunday and their hours are much more limited. The UPS store where I had my mailbox was open from eight to six every weekday, 10 to four on Saturdays and 10 to three on Sundays. So I really had a very big window of time in which I could go pick up my mail. I wasn't restricted by the opening hours of the post office, which can be very difficult to get somewhere that's open from nine to five if you're working from nine to five, even if that is working from home. The next perk of the UPS mailbox is that they can receive mail from all shipping carriers. So I thought at first that UPS mailboxes can only get mail from UPS, but that's not true. They can get mail from UPS, FedEx, USPS, Amazon, any of the big shipping carriers will deliver to there. Whereas at the post office with a PO box, you can actually only get mail through USPS at a PO box, I found out. And that was the main reason why I chose the UPS mailbox over the US PO box. The last major perk of a UPS mailbox is that your address is formatted much more like a business or apartment address so that I could actually use it at doctor's offices and on other paperwork without anybody questioning me. There are certain times where it will say like can't ship to a PO box or you can't give you know a PO box as your address at the doctor's office but I could use my UPS mailbox address for this because if we take a look at this is kind of a sample format of how that address will look it basically just looks like a regular apartment address. If you look at that address, this is not my real address, by the way, the address is the address of the UPS store, the shopping plaza that it's in. The suite is the location of the UPS store within that shopping center. And then 190 is the mailbox number, which is my mailbox number. But from just the way this looks, you would never know if this is just a regular business or an apartment address. So over time, I realized that was a big unintentional perk of the UPS mailbox that I wouldn't have had if I had done a USPS PO box. Now for topic number eight in this video, official paperwork. Yay. Uh, all the nitty gritty stuff. 
So my best suggestion is honestly, check your car registration, check your driver's license, check your passport, see when all these things expire before you even start traveling. If you're close to the expiration date, see if you can just renew those things early because once you are in a different state than your license is in, it gets a lot harder to do all of this, especially because you don't really have an address for them to exactly mail you your new license to very easily. So I wish I would have thought of that before I started traveling, you know, in a year and a half, of being on the road, eventually things are going to start expire. My car registration did eventually expire in this time. And so what I had to do was I had to re-register my car to my old address and then set up forwarding so that that mail would make it to a family member's house. And then I had to have that family member, once they got the sticker and the registration information, I had to have them open that mail and then send it to me where I was actually located at that time. Of course, with any of this kind of official paperwork, the mailing times are really long where like you might get this anywhere from two weeks from now to six months from now. So you really need to have a stable address or person that can be receiving that mail for you if you do end up having to do something like this on the road. But I was lucky because my car registration could be renewed online, but that's not always the case. And also every state has different rules on this to make it even more confusing. So your best bet is to take a look at all of this stuff before you even start traveling and just save yourself the headache. But there are ways around it if you do run into this situation. It's just something to think through ahead of time. Because when you're traveling, you really want to be in the moment and enjoying those experiences, meeting those new people. You don't want to be bogged down with paperwork and chores and making phone calls. Anyways, these are just some of the logistical challenges around not having an address that I've had to work through. I hope you guys found this video to be helpful. Obviously, traveling full-time, super rewarding. You get to see new places, meet new people, and there's just so many new experiences that you get to have in a relatively short amount of time. So I think it's totally worth it, but there definitely are some real logistical challenges that you do have to work through along the way. So I hope this video made that process a little bit easier on you. Anyways, I just want to thank you so much for watching. Bye, YouTube.